Thank you for joining us. Welcome to All in the Corporate Family. Uh, I'll try my joke again. <laughs> uh, if you're born after the 70s, which some of you are, I, you may not know that a very famous sitcom was called All in the Family with Archie Bunker. So that was our, our inspiration. Um, we're going to be speaking about corporate governance within corporate groups. And uh, we're going to do it by speaking a little bit about the law with some litigators. And also, uh, we're going to go through a fact pattern. So we are corporate lawyers. I, I'm a corporate lawyer here at Goodman's. I work in the uh, financing area. Also, I do a lot of restructuring. And you know, when companies have financial difficulty is often the situation where you really are find yourselves looking at corporate governance and particularly capital structure, how money's gone in, how money's come out. So that, those are the kinds of things I'm going to talk about. But we've set it up so that we are somewhat explaining a situation to our litigators and our litigators are, are giving us some advice about where we may have gone right or wrong. Um, so uh, we're just each going to introduce ourselves and then our first speaker will be Peter speaking a little bit about the law. So uh, thanks Celia. I'm Carrie McKay and like Celia I'm a corporate lawyer here at Goodman's. And, and pretty much, as Celia said, she does restructuring, Peter and Julie do litigation, and I try to avoid speaking to my friends, Celia, Julie, and Peter. And, and so that's going to be sort of my role in our presentation this morning. But uh, yeah, we look forward to it. My name's Peter Cole. I'm a litigator here at Goodman's. I've litigated a bunch of cases, or a few cases, involving corporate separateness issues, piercing the corporate veil issues. So it's an area of law that I sort of find very interesting. So um, hopefully I won't get too far into the weeds for, for people today. Uh, my name's Julie Rosenthal. Uh, I'm also in the litigation department. Always makes me feel a little sad when my corporate colleagues uh, are so scared of us. We're very friendly. <laughs> um, maybe it has something to do with how excited we get when things go wrong. But uh, <laughs> hopefully what we'll be able to give you today is some, some uh, practical tips on how to stay out of our offices. So before we get to uh, a bit of a fact pattern, like Celia mentioned, I'm just going to just briefly speak about corporate separateness as a concept and then uh, some recent legal cases about uh, piercing the corporate veil just to set the table a little bit and lead into the, 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 the bigger discussion. Um, you'll see on the slide up there that corporate separateness is uh, a fundamental concept for probably everybody in this room. Um, it is obviously impacted a lot by case law and how judges interpret things, but the, the, the fundamental, I guess, font of corporate separateness comes from the corporate statutes that are in place across Canada and also um, you know, nationally with the, the Canada Business Corporations Act. So you'll see I've, I've excerpted a few provisions. Section 15 you know, speaks about the corporation and having the capacity you know, and the rights, powers, and privileges of a, of a natural person and so, you know, simple words, but, you know, a very powerful concept that you treat, you know, a corporation like it's an individual, like it's a separate person. Section 45 speaks about shareholders not being liable for the, the liabilities or the defaults of a corporation. So that's the concept of limited liability that obviously, you know, people often is the main reason why you want to incorporate. And then you have section five, which I just note because it, we're speaking about corporate groups, corporate families, and so the, the, the legislation explicitly allows for corporations to create other corporations. Uh, I'll be speaking a bit about this, this you know, case, but there's an excerpt from the bottom, the Chevron case. Uh, and in that case, there was a, uh, a foreign judgment, a multi-billion dollar foreign judgment against an American parent company. And instead of enforcing that judgment against the American parent, they tried to enforce it against a seventh level Canadian subsidiary in Canada. And one of the allegations that was made was that, that these concepts of separate corporate personality, corporate separateness, were a mere legal fiction, or that the assets of the, 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 the subsidiary were just an asset of the parent. And so th th there was a, you know, the case sort of went into a lot of detail about how to approach those types of concepts. And one thing that the court said, and it's the quote at the bottom of the slide, is that you know, this distinction between corporations and their shareholders is a, is a bedrock principle of corporate law. And so it, it gets then into, once you have that corporate separateness, how do you get rid of it? And so there, there's a, a case from the 1980s uh, from the Supreme Court where the court um, uh, said essentially, you pierce the corporate veil you know, whenever it would be opposed to justice not to, not to do so, which is a very 
and that's how people have interpreted that case. And so I say that only to sort of you know, try to highlight that these concepts of corporate separateness and how to pierce the corporate veil, they do shift through time. The slide, as you see there, it's got what is the current test in Ontario from this, from this Chevron case. And it's got sort of, you know, three main ways where you can pierce the corporate veil. It's when there's either a statute or a contract that <coughs> says so, when the corporation is a mere facade, that's the second one, and then when the corporation is an agent. And then you have the, 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 the mere facade elaboration below, and that's the, usually the main angle that people take to try to attack corporate separateness. And then you, it, it requires you to prove two things. One, that there's complete domination and control by the parent of the subsidiary, and that there is some sort of improper purpose. So you have this two-part test in Ontario now, and you know, I wanted just to highlight that, that element of wrongdoing underlies the case law a lot, so that it, it's seen as, again, the courts have in Canada seen as a fundamental thing, and then you want to make sure that you only get rid of it when, when, when there's some element of unfairness or wrongdoing. Um, in that same Chevron case, there was an allegation that the whole group of companies together were all one big corporate thing, and therefore they could all be treated as one. And so the court, in you know, at least one passage, spoke directly to that point, and they said that there is no you know, group enterprise liability doctrine, at least in Ontario. So you can't just treat all the corporations in a corporate group as one for purposes of enforcing debts and liabilities. And that's sort of an important principle because it, it, it demonstrates that they're, that they're, that they're following what, what the CBCA said and probably gives you guys some comfort if you're involved in corporations that have you know, subsidiaries or parents that that, that concept, at least you know, in Ontario right now, is, is one that, that is being respected. Um, and so out of, those, out of that case and out of other cases, what you have, and we just you know, put a few on the slide here, is that like, th th those concepts, though, even though they're much more now from that, you know, the, the, the test that I put up, the mere facade one, although that test is much more, I guess, clear than it had been before when it was much more sort of equitable, th the courts still look at just various considerations, and every fact case is going to depend on its certain facts. So you've got considerations like, do the directors and officers, do they manage their own business? Does the corporation or the subsidiary maintain their own records? Do they comply with, with, with the laws that are applicable to them? Has, has the subsidiary managed and developed its own business plans and, and, and budgets? Does it have its own workforce? And so all these concepts um, that are around with this fact pattern, like the facts really can matter in any one circumstance. Overriding the whole thing, of course, is this view that is there some sort of element of wrongdoing because Again, you know, th th these tests are very fact specific and they can change. And, and I think that you know, one takeaway is that you, know, you, 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 you might not know exactly which way something is gonna go. So, and so when it comes to us as litigators, we often have just sort of like the documents there and everything already baked in. And there's lots that people actually can do on the ground as corporate lawyers, as general counsels, to try to sort of you know, set the table so that if you ever encounter a circumstance or someone is trying to pierce the corporate veil or attack that, then you have some comfort about what, what your, your situation looks like. So I think Celia, I think you're gonna sure, so here's our might need to grab that microphone. Okay, uh, uh, here's our fact pattern that we're gonna work with. Uh, so our first slide is just a simple corporate chart, Canadian public parent, two intervening holding companies, one Canadian, one in Cayman, and then a subsidiary operating in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so uh, the uh, subsidiary, which we're calling Overseas Co., all the names are very imaginative, um, operates a mine in the DRC, um, has a tailings pond contained by an earth-filled berm situated beside an important river. Uh, Parent Co., of course, has a CapEx pol capital expenditures policy, and under that policy, Overseas Co. has sought approval from the parent for funding to reinforce the berm. Uh, this request has been being reviewed in the normal course, but in that time frame, the berm ruptures and causing significant harm. So when this happened, as when the berm failed, the first communication was an email uh, from uh, the local manager, which was um, rather alarming. So he says, I am writing you about a disaster. The berm containing the tailings pond of our mine just ruptured. I've seen the damage with my own eyes. 
I don't believe anyone is hurt, but all the effluent that was in the pond is now in the river. This would not have happened if our request for funding to reinforce the berm had been approved. Please contact me as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, a few days prior to the berm failure, uh, Overseas Co. and then the two intervening subsidiaries uh, paid their regular quarterly corporate dividend to their respective shareholders. Um, now we're, we're sort of dealing in the time frame after this has all happened. So we're not dealing with the crisis and what what was done in the moment. We're looking at the aftermath and where, where does the company stand now? Um, so uh, Parent Co. has invested significant funds in, in Overseas Co. To, to remedy the situation and they believe they've addressed all the environmental damage that was, was caused by, by the berm failure. But at this point, they feel the mine is no longer financially viable and they are contemplating shutting down the mine and actually divesting entirely of their operations. So uh, our exercise, and we're going to do a little bit of role playing, but lower your expectations in terms <laughs> of the acting chops. Um, and <laughs> Carrie and I are going to be the corporate lawyers kind of walking through some of the things that we've, we, the, the preliminary investigation we've done to kind of uh, inform our litigator colleagues and, and see if we can come to um, a conclusion about the likelihood that there, whether or not there is likely residual liability risk for the parent. Um, so we'll hand, Carrie. Let, let's, let's dig into the facts a little bit and I'm sure Peter and Julie are gonna ask us, you know, what does JPAC do in the ordinary course that would be indicative of corporate separateness? So, so from a corporate perspective, Truthfully, although limiting litigation is always important, you know, there are a number of reasons for diligently maintaining good corporate governance and parent-subsidiary relationships. There's what I like to think of as sort of the corporate ready position, just being ready and able, nimble and able to react to things, not litigation per se, but if you have good corporate records and good governance, you're able to get on with diligence quickly you're able to you're prepared for financings either granting guarantees or granting security and frankly you can just complete transactions that much more quickly so it's just being ready and, and, and having checklists and knowing what has to happen when things when when transactions are unfolding so uh, beyond the practical benefits quite frankly there are as securities legislation that would say that particularly in the context of issuers operating in emerging markets, there is guidance and they would like to see a uh, sort of more rigorous approach to the diligence and the oversight and functioning of operations in emerging markets. So, you know, 51720 reminds us of the importance of monitors and controls in relation to the risks of operating in foreign jurisdictions. At JPAC, I know that they have set up their subsidiaries so that each subsidiary has its own board and it has local folks on each of their board. That helps them, I know, from our experience in working with them, to have a better understanding of the legal, cultural, political, and frankly, language environments in which each of their subsidiaries operate. I think, you know, Celia, I've heard you use this expression, oversight isn't domination. So Parent Co., yes, makes strategic decisions for the overall entity, for the overall corporation, and strategic decisions are initiated at the top, but from my experience, JPAC's Overseas Co. looks at every <coughs> one of those itself. It also has operation, makes operational decisions itself. And the local board and the officers look at e everything that comes down the pipe and everything that goes back up the pipe. And so they actually operate a business unto themselves, although there is this strategic vision for the entire organization. You see that in the case law. The case law you know, speaks about this domination point. And if you're trying to pierce the corporate veils, they're complete domination and control. So it's very important to have a local board of directors that is making its own decisions that are being then documented in the correct way under the, the local law. Again, that's another, it, it, it's, you know, from a litigation perspective, it's a defense against these types of, um, you know, claims of veil piercing, but from a corporate side, it just makes you that much able to, you know, deal with local rules, language, and all those other things. So it's, it's a multifaceted benefit to, to having a, an independent uh, board of directors and management that are doing things on the ground. 
And so, I mean, speaking of doing things on the ground, documentation, I, I remember, Peter, you telling me something about like needing their own documentation, that each entity needs to do its own work. And uh, my experience with JPAC is, in fact, that when they have documents, contracts, agreements, and so on, each of the organizations executes those documents using its own legal entity, and they go through the legal formalities in each of their local jurisdictions. Now, I know, I can tell you from experience, <laughs> you know, that there are a lot of entities, and JPAC is, is one of them that struggles with maintaining the formalities in other jurisdictions. You know, I know I hear from the general counsel all the time, the corporate development team just wants to get the deal done. Why do we have to have a meeting in Cayman Islands with actual people having 48 hours notice to sign a document in its original form? But the reality is, thankfully, our general counsel at, Gen at, uh, at JPAC has has trained everyone, shall we say, to respect the importance of these formalities. So my experience with JPAC, at least, is that you know they actually they do respect the uh, the formalities in each of the jurisdictions in which they operate, DRC, Cayman, and Canada, quite frankly. And uh, so when they're doing transactions, I think it works. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, you know it, it, the. Whenever you obviously have a, a parent, a public parent entity, it's always difficult. You know, you have a, it's a balancing act. Who's kidding who? You f there's a fine line, inevitably, between each entity within its group operating its own business and presenting themselves as a whole. And, you know, I mean, even when it comes to things like securities, securities law and disclosure obligations, our securities legislation requires us to speak in plain language, and who's kidding who, even most of those prospectuses are hard to read for the layperson, truthfully. But the easiest way to talk in plain language is to refer to ourselves as JPAC. Use the words we, our, everything is a collective. So, you know, I, you know how do we present ourselves, or, you know, do you have tips for presenting ourselves to keep to respect both the securities legislation, but also not get ourselves into trouble down the road, and somebody's going to sort of say, "Oh, there's the there's the bullet." They actually think that uh, they are all one organization. And, and you see it in the case law again. People look at take these, you know, uh, uh, communications from a corporation that speak about the corporation in general, and they might try to use that as a way to say that there's no corporate separateness between them. And I think it's something that Julie's going to speak about a bit later on. Is that you also then you know, you know, use that maybe in certain ways to try to, you know, directly give liability to the parent because the parent is speaking for everybody. And so, you know, there really is really that, that tension between sort of following what, you know, the, the especially like securities disclosure requirements that say you have to do certain things and then, you know, you need to ma you know, maintain the, the, the separateness of all these different entities. I mean, you know, one, you know, you know, point about the securities regulation is, you know, it might say you have to, you know, in your disclosure, speak about what your subsidiaries say. And, you know, I guess from a theoretical point of view, you could say, well, geez, you know, I'm the parent. I'm a completely separate corporation. I've got, I'm a natural person. All my subs are as well. You know, so why do you have to, you know, do that, you know, disclosure? And, and, and it's in one of the slides that I had on earlier, but one of the exceptions to corporate separateness is when a statute requires it. So when a statute says you have to treat your subsidiaries for, disclosure purposes and report on those, it wouldn't be a defense to that to say, oh boy, I'm a, I'm a separate company and those subs are a separate company. The court would sort of look through that if you tried to raise that argument and say, no, for the purposes of, of this statute, you do have to follow this law and therefore you do have to report. But that shouldn't mean though that then when it comes time for other liability for whatever reason that all the companies are treated as one. That's you know, a small derogation from corporate separateness required by statute, but it doesn't then make the whole thing a corporate group that is liable for each, other, for each other's debts. So similarly then, you know, when we think about guidance for emerging issuers, and I think it's just generally good practice anyways, like I know that JPAC board actually goes on site to each of their properties once a year. And so, you know, they like to know there's good visibility, there's good transparency there as to what's happening at each of the operations. But I think what you're telling me then is having those good practices isn't going to negate their ability to, uh, to actually maintain a separateness from the operations so long as they have the other things That's in place. 
That's right. And so even on, on this slide here, there's some language in here about, you know, about you know, what you can put in perhaps to press releases and other reporting documents when you're speaking in that, you know, you know, royal, you know, you know, JPAC <laughs> speaking for the whole for the whole entity, you know, so that you can defend against an allegation that by doing so you're somehow treating everybody the same or the parent is dominating the subsidiaries. You can use similar language to this, which says, you know, although we're referring to that, you know, broader term, we're not we're, you know, it doesn't mean that we're not separate. In fact, we are separate. So that kind of, again, corporate record keeping it, you know, at least from a lit, you know, litigator's point of view, you, know, you, take, you take some comfort from that because it, it will give some protection. And it really does actually, and you see it in the case law, providing protection that the courts actually care about what's in all of these documents. Maybe we should touch on some of their corporate finance and their capital structure as well. Sure. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, one of the things that you want, to, you want to be in this situation as Carrie is when you're speaking to <laughs> litigators, you want to be presenting a diligent That is company. Carrie, really, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, because part of, part of doing all of this is, is for um, peace of mind and knowledge that, you know, when something goes wrong, how does your company appear? Because this always comes up because something has gone wrong. And just having that everyday day-to-day -day diligence around documentation and you know respect it's sort of I, I think it's kind of funny that it's called parenting because it is a lot like parenting right the parent establishes good values it teaches its subsidiaries how to behave but then it has to give them the independence to you know follow those values and and so you know you uh, the corporate separateness legal principle is very strong it's very difficult to pierce the corporate veil but it's also good to know that to have a lot of confidence around the fact that you know that you you you've done that work you've been diligent on, on a day-to-day -day basis so that if if you're in a situation where something really wrong has gone wrong at your company you feel confident about presenting the company as as a diligent company that's careful about all of these things and you know when you're when your documentation is really careful, it shows you're a careful company. Um, so I, I, I think that's just, um, it, it's, it's, it's a sleep at night factor as well. And the, and the other thing is that the things that are really a pain for us corporate lawyers in doing deals, that rec and they're actually a blessing in disguise. And, and you, first of all, just for a financing, you, you need to have every resolution. Every, you have to have every board approve every you know, document they sign. Or you know, from a tax perspective, tax follows the corporate results. So you, you have a weakness from a, the point of view of your tax position if you're not very detailed and careful in your, in your records. And also if you're dealing with jurisdictions like Luxembourg is a great example where it's incredibly important that a Luxembourg entity makes decisions via a board and uh, with proper information in front of them actually makes the decision in Luxembourg. And they, there's such a no, knowledge base and skill set in, in Luxembourg around making decisions for a subsidiary it, and, and understanding that balance between the direction that comes from the parent, but decision making at, at the uh, sub. So, you know, part of maybe our message here is all the work that I think many of you do to enforce this level of diligence and perhaps put people through their paces sometimes when it's it's annoying it really it's really has a lot of value and, and and in the context of something like this where you're defending corporate separateness all that careful diligent record keeping is hugely impactful so you know that's just sort of a reinforcement to those of you who are trying to enforce that within your own organizations probably speaking preaching to the choir a little bit probably yeah. my guess is in most of this room but yeah it's good so CapEx? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, the uh, we do we have our fact pattern is that there there was s some indication that there was a problem with the berm through this CapEx request to reinforce it. So that's you know certainly. Um, I think a fact that <laughs> litigators would seize upon, um, but the reality is, is that you know there's a constant um, capital expenditure process in any company, and requests are made, and they are reviewed, and there's timeframes. So you know one of the things that 
um, we've kind of set out here is that, you know, in this particular case, it, the, the CapEx procedure is pretty well set up because they've, um, they've, they've got a concept of, and I think most companies have this, you know, you've got to flag something that is urgent. So things are considered, you've got to identify, is this maintenance CapEx or is this an urgent situation that needs to be dealt with immediately? And also they have um, sort of a standards around response times to requests. So yes, there was a request. It was made prior to the berm failure, but, and obviously with the benefit of hindsight, the problem was much more serious than was appreciated. But, you know, I guess I'll ask my litigation colleagues if they, how they feel about um, how we're doing on our CapEx policy and, and how, how much of a problem this is. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So, so up until now, um, Carrie and Peter and Celia have been giving you all the good news, um, and <laughs> um, and and what a fabulous job the company's been doing, and and giving you the important message that all of the I'm sure very irritating steps that need to be taken have value, are protective, um, and the the focus here is that when there's a problem at a subsidiary, there will always be a desire on the part of plaintiffs to reach through to the deep pockets of the parent. So the question, as a litigator, that's always in my mind is, what are the odds of that hand breaking through to get in into the parent's pocket? So the good news is it sounds like this company is well positioned to defend uh, a direct assault, a, a, a clear attempt to say the parent should be directly liable for the actions of its subsidiary, the classic piercing of the corporate veil. Uh, but the bad news that I'm here to deliver is there are a, at least a couple of other possible avenues that a plaintiff might try to follow to, to get through to the assets uh, that they want. And there really are two, um, th and both are novel. Um, and developing. And the two are these. The first is we see a growing attempt by plaintiffs to try to use group-wide corporate policies against the parent, to somehow leverage those policies into a foundation for liability of the parent directly. And the second, which is even more <laughs> Um, nascent, I would say, and, and even earlier in its development, is a, our attempts to use other forms of tort liability, negligence liability. I think a failure of a duty to warn is, a, is particularly ripe um, for plaintiffs to try and use. So as I said, th this is very new law. It's far from clear, but m my gut tells me that it's coming, that there is a growing desire, um, certainly a growing desire by plaintiffs to access when they need to the greater resources of the parent, when the sub's assets are insufficient to satisfy liability. And some of these cases eventually are going to succeed. A and one thing to remember is like, judges are people. <laughs> and if they don't, if the judge doesn't like the facts, the judge is going to find a legal route to get to the result that he or she wants to get to. And a lot of, of what Peter and, and Celia and Carrie were talking about is, I, I think the ultimate message is you can't have it both ways. Right? So if you're in a, in a complex corporate structure and you want to have the benefit of separate corporate entities, then you got to bear the burdens. And if the judge thinks you were trying to sneak through and get all of the benefits without bearing all of the burdens, you're going to find yourself in trouble. So the, the first method, the first avenue I mentioned is, is using corporate policies. And what does that look like? Well, the, the leading case on this, and it's very recent, it came out about six months ago, is a decision of the UK Supreme Court called Vedanta Resources. And the facts looked like this. You had a UK parent with a Zambian subsidiary. There was an environmental problem at the subsidiary which operated a mining operation and pollutants were released into a local stream. And the claim was made by locals uh, for the environmental damage. 
They claimed against the subsidiary, that's straightforward, but they also claimed against the parent, and they did not try to do a direct piercing of the corporate veil. They did not say the, the sub was a mere puppet or a facade. They didn't do that at all. Instead, what they did was twofold, but both aspects of their argument hinged off the parent's environmental policy. So what the parent had is, is very responsibly had a group-wide, because it was a, a multinational group, they had a group-wide environmental policy. And the plaintiff said, well, your environmental policy was flawed, it was negligently designed, it failed to address this particular issue that then materialized, and if you had taken due care in drafting your policy, you would have anticipated this problem better, and your failure to do so has led to the damage. And they said, so you, the parent, owe a direct duty to the locals. You obviously knew this was important. That's why you enacted the policy. Their second argument was they said, even if your policy was OK, y you talked a lot in your, in your public disclosure about how the parent was taking steps to make sure all of the members of the corporate group were following the policy. But you didn't. You were negligent in your oversight of your subs. And, and I'm just going to pause for a moment. There is obviously a tension <laughs> between this kind of argument and the typical piercing the corporate veil argument. Because you say, well, hang on. On the one hand, I'm told I'm not allowed to dominate my sub. And on the other hand, you're telling me I have to be really careful in supervising them. A and yeah, like that, the good luck resolving that tension, because I don't think <laughs> it's so straightforward. But Again, I think it, it just comes back to if the, if the judge doesn't like what he or she sees, they're going to find a way. So, and I think in, in this Vedanta case, what troubled the court, and I sh sorry, I should pause for a moment. The case went before the UK Supreme Court on a preliminary basis because the defendant said, look, this, this case shouldn't even be allowed to proceed. It should be struck out at the earliest stages. And the UK Supreme Court said, not so fast. If the plaintiffs can <coughs> establish those facts, yeah, that might be a basis for a negligence finding directly against the parent. So when I say how do you resolve the tensions, it hasn't been done, the case hasn't gone to trial, and to my knowledge, no other case like it has gone to trial. But it's a decision of the highest court in the UK saying, yeah, this is a viable claim. So my guess about how, oh, sorry, question. Sorry, let's, can we get you a mic so that everyone on the but web just, can hear you? Just repeat, the question. just repeat the question. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Is the court in that case saying that if there is a duty, the duty is owed to the locals, or is it a duty that's owed to the subsidiary that then they have to fund the subsidiary? No, it's a duty owed to the locals. On what basis? I, I, well, it, it's not as clearly explained as you might like, but but... Here's what I think. I think what the court is, it was motivating the court is they say, if you have a, a, a parent of a multinational group and the parent thinks it's important enough to enact group-wide environmental policies, who are, the, who are the ultimate beneficiaries of these environmental policies? The people living, the, the direct beneficiaries are the people living in the jurisdictions closest to the operations who are going to be most directly affected if there's an environmental problem. And so I think what the, what's motivating the, the court is they say, this policy is, is a recognition, is an admission, although the court doesn't use that language, but a recognition that, that the parent through its operations is creating a potentially dangerous situation. The policies are a recognition of a kind of, uh, of, a kind of legal proximity. And, and so whether it's the policy itself that creates the duty or if the policy is really just a recognition or an admission of the duty, the court really didn't explain it very clearly. But, but I think th it's probably both of those factors, that it, it both creates the duty, it's a recognition of the duty, and it's also a recognition of, of the business reality, which is the parent owns this asset that may create a danger. And the the parent, by enacting these policies, is recognizing that it needs to ensure steps are taken to mitigate that danger. So I, it's not as nicely articulated in the case law as you might like, but I think that's what's driving it. 
but you see Julie, it, may, uh, go ahead. I was saying, you see it in the, 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 there's, a, there's a few cases that are like this, and you see it, and it goes back to this issue about just how separate and how, and how separate the parent is from the sub, because in some circumstances, there, maybe there's a case uh, involving Shell out of the UK as well, where the court said the policies in that place, the same kind of you know, attempt to find liability, the, the bad thing happened to a sub, and you know overseas and the parent had a policy and therefore the parent should be directly liable for that and in that case the court looked at it and said no the policies are more like sort of general guidance the sub on the ground was the one responsible for what was happening they were making their decisions themselves so that that connection wasn't close enough to really allow that direct liability so it it, it goes it, 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 some of the same factors that go to that piercing test, whether or not there is a lot of domination by the parent to the sub, and also then the, the sort of the, the, this, this, you know, is there some level of wrongdoing? You, you don't really see it in Vedanta as much, but you then see the, what, what, what Julie said, which is that you see courts wanting to find ways to resolve the, the, you know, the, 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 the problem and do justice. So, you know, when Celia says, you know, like the law of piercing the corporate veil, at least right now in Ontario, is quite you know, more clearly defined than it's been, I think, for a while. That doesn't mean that there aren't sort of other avenues, you know, other, you know, you know, avenues for courts to find ways around that if they want, if they think they want to do justice. So, you know, it just goes to show that, you know, as, you know, as Carrie was saying, you know, you want to be in that corporate ready position and have as many of the factors, you know, that you can point to to show, you know, separation, good policy keeping, following local laws, having a board of directors that's independent, enough of that stuff that, because you know the tests can, can sometimes be very amorphous, and so the, the more you have you know check marks in your favor on the you know the one side of the ledger, is you know in theory going to protect you and let you sleep at night. And I think I mean we can even skip ahead a couple of slides to JPAC's environmental <laughs> policy. Um, it did like in our scenario, JPAC does have an environmental policy, but you know when we sat down, I mean after the Vedanta decision came out, and we sat down as a group and thought, how do you thread this needle? Like w the balance between the subsidiary uh, having its own operations as opposed to a sort of dominant, we keep using the word dominion, domination by the parent. You know, I think I I as we've talked about, and Peter and I, Peter was alluding to it a as well, um, having an environmental policy that subsidiaries are, are required to comply with, they affirm annually the way Overseas Co. does, and J Parent Co. has an environmental compliance plan to review operations. Having the, uh, uh, those sorts of things are actually required, quite frankly, of emerging market <laughs> issuers under the OSC guidance. It's important for a parent to exercise vigilance in what its subsidiaries are doing, notwithstanding that at the same time we are, the intention is that the uh, that the subsidiaries are operating on their own. So, you know, I think if you if you just take it back a step, because quite frankly, Vedanta was terrifying to me when I first <laughs> heard about it. it. You know, it really just comes back to sort of basic principles of good governance. And yes, your subsidiaries need to be running their own operations. They need to adopt these policies. These these. Uh, you know, corporate-wide policies, but they need to look at it with with some skepticism, shall we say, and actually know, can we comply with that? It's quite possible that some subsidiaries just, quite frankly, can't, or there's something that they need twisted or, or tweaked, shall we say, on I I in the construct of their complying with a corporate-wide policy. That's okay, and in fact, even better. It's a demonstration of people actually having thoughtful compliance. So there's a thoughtful strategic umbrella policy and there's thoughtful conscious compliance at each of the subsidiaries levels. So as I say, as I was having heart failure when Julie first told me about Vedanta, you know, when you get down to it and really start to work through it, a lot of it is sort of basic principles of, of good governance and, and good practice, quite frankly. And in, in Vedanta, one of the, the few specific details that the court keyed off of was they repeated uh, statements made by the parents, uh, public disclosure about its enforcement, its oversight of this environmental policy. And I think, again, that it gives you a little insight into what's motivating the court, which is this notion that a company can't have it both ways. If you're making these public statements, there's obviously a benefit to the corporate group in publicizing 
uh, the, the group-wide enforcement and the group-wide monitoring of these policies. So the, I think what the court is, is thinking is, well, if you want that benefit, then you have to take the burden of it, which is putting your money where your mouth is and making sure you're actually doing what, what you say you're doing. I uh, know that there are friends on either side of this room who I've heard say, you can't have a policy unless you're going to follow the policy. Don't just have a policy. That's not, that's not helping anyone. So follow the policy or don't put it in place. Um, so, th so Vedanta obviously was an environmental policy. W what are the other kinds of policies that, that an enterprising plaintiff's lawyer might seize upon? Um, the environmental is, is the most obvious and I think will be the one in the future that we'll see most frequently. But I think also uh, human rights and human resources policies are also ripe uh, for the picking for, for these kinds of efforts to get at the deeper pockets of the parents. But you can see it in sort of in financing policies requirements to do, you know, for certain capital requirements. Those are all kinds of things that you could, you know, you could in theory, you know, use the same logic and say that if the parent is saying to the, sub, you know, subsidiary or the indirect subsidiary, you have to do the following things, that if it's, you know, closely enough related to the harm that ultimately results, then maybe the parent might have that liability. So it, it really could be a very broadly, you know, you know, struck sort of liability, and it's important then to balance that you know, the, pol the needs of the policies of the parents. Because it's obviously like that's the main piece. Like the reason why you have these corporate groups is because there's a benefit to having that expertise that can be shared out amongst all of the different subsidiaries. And, but you know, th that's the tension because then if you have sort of too much control there, you can fall both into the Pierce and the corporate veil type situation or even this, this, this direct liability on the parents. So there's that tension there that, that isn't easily resolvable and really doesn't have a clear answer. Back Julie, yeah, I was going to say, maybe let's go back because we sort of, I think we're comfortable with the environment, JPAC's environmental policy, but I think you, you mentioned the duty to warn and, and you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about their, the cap, CapEx structure here. They did have notice of, of this needing funds for the, f to, to fix the berm. Like, what's this duty to warn? So, so I, th this has not yet emerged clearly from the case law. Um, but I think, I, I think it's, uh, we're, we're likely to see it. So duty to warn is a concept that emerged out of product liability cases. So you sell a medicine, which is very beneficial, but it has side effects. You're the manufacturer, you're obliged to warn the public about the potential harm from this medication so that people can take appropriate precautions. It, it was very quickly extended uh, beyond the manufacturers to suppliers um, and has been extended beyond that to any situation where a person creates, not negligently, but creates a risk, creates a potentially dangerous situation, the courts have imposed a duty and negligence on that person to warn those who could reasonably be foreseen to be at risk from that. Um, so here, going back to our fact pattern, what have we got? Well, we have, we have the tailings pond, which I think would fall within the category of a potentially dangerous situation that's been created, necessary obviously for the operation of the business, subject to all of the usual uh, protections and precautions, but potentially a source of danger. We have uh, directors, I believe, of the parent company who go for inspections of the mine, which likely included the tailings pond, as part of, the, as part of following their group environmental policy. And we have a request for a maintenance uh, budget allotment for the tailings pond. So how might a plaintiff uh, spin that? Well, the plaintiff might say, you you effectively created the situation, and it's a, I think this is a stretch, but you, if you parent effectively created the situation by purchasing this asset, by setting up this subsidiary and allowing it to create this dangerous item, dangerous object in the tailings pond. You knew it was dangerous. Your executives were there not long before the collapse. They either knew or ought to have known that the collapse was imminent. And, and on our fact pattern, the plaintiffs are going to have a hard time establishing that in fact, because it sounds like no one was raising up 
uh, very alarming noises or, or, or big red flags, but, but the plaintiff will allege it. And you can imagine facts will emerge to say, well, you should have known there was this seepage or that seepage, and, and had, you, had you looked a little more carefully at the pond, you should have seen it. And what you ought to have done is you ought to have warned, they might say, the local authorities. They might say the local villagers, who then could have, have taken some mitigation efforts to protect the river more properly. So th the key factual fight will be, is this a danger that ought reasonably to have been foreseen? In this case, luckily for our company, the answer is probably no. But you can imagine other situations where the answer isn't nearly as clear cut. So uh, just shifting gears a little bit, um, another important factor in corporate separateness or more another avenue to go to the parent for recovery is looking at the capital structure. So in our fact pattern, we've had a dividend paid uh, just shortly prior to the events. And uh, there's a two-year clawback for dividends, at least in Canada. Now, of course, we're talking about Canadian law, and the DRC law would be very relevant, but we're not really that competent to speak about that. So we're just talking about Canadian law. <clears throat> so we're, we've set out here um, some procedures that we follow, which really, these are excellent. I think I, if you take nothing else away from here, I, I would love to see people be uh, provide a little additional documentation around dividends because under the uh, under the OBCA and the CBCA, there's there's a defense for directors who because there's director liability as well if they've paid a dividend uh, when the company was insolvent and you know the circumstances were such that they should have known. So you know simple steps of first of all there should be more than a recital there should be a piece of paper from a financial officer that says here's the financial situation of the company can be unaudited financial statements quarterly is fine um, and you know we've applied the solvency test that applies under our governing corporate law and the company is solvent if you deliver that to your directors then that's a extremely strong statutorily recognized defense for them which is good for your directors and good for your company as well because those directors are indemnified <coughs> um, also, contingent liabilities have to be factored in to that analysis. And uh, so this, everything in the, our situation, in our fact pattern, will be looked at with the benefit of hindsight. So having a piece of paper at the time the dividend was paid that shows we thought about contingent liabilities, this was not on our radar as, as a contingent liability, is very helpful. So, so that kind of documentation both helps your directors establish a defense, also helps, uh, there's no diligence defense for a shareholder, but it still establishes kind of the facts at the time and helps you show, you know, at the time there wasn't a reasonable basis to think that the company was insolvent. Um, so that's, that's kind of Cadillac uh, behavior on dividends. The other, so that's kind I of money Celia, out. Yeah. Sorry, just to interrupt there, <clears throat> excuse me. I think too, in addition to protecting your directors, which has to be, should be the, the, in the front of everyone's minds, but also quite frankly, I mean, having these sorts of procedures at every step in the chain of the corporate chain, quite frankly, is also something that we've seen the Canadian Public Accounting Board and securities regulators taking note of. They want to see a greater vigilance. They haven't got around to the, the actually regulations on this yet, but you know, they want to see real professional skepticism at e in the auditing of each of the entities in a chain. And so having these kinds of documentations that you're, that you're talking about just goes to uh, better vigilance, shall we say, on the part of the auditors and knowing that everything has been done in accordance and the final financial records really can be represented, uh, represented as presenting a fair view of the company, right? Um, so the, the sort of flip side of dividends is how has money gone in? So the first, the first point that we made here is that um, the, these companies are, are properly um, capitalized, like they don't have unreasonably small capital. And a company that has no real, when, when the parent hasn't put equity into the company, that's an indicia of, of potential uh, attack on corporate separateness because how can a subsidiary would be separate if it doesn't have the wherewithal to run its operations itself. Um, 
but then in the in our in our fact pattern, um, our parent our parent is a pretty diligent corporate citizen. We feel we've portrayed them that way, <laughs> uh, and and one of the things they they're not trying to walk away from environmental damage. They've actually put in the funding to to address the problem. What they're simply trying to do, and this is usually the situation I find where I'm consulted, it, it's really not about like, well, that's a complete disaster. We just want to walk away from it. It's more like, uh, you know, okay, we this was a problem. We obviously had to fix it. We fixed it, but now we want to know it's done. Like we don't have lingering liability. Um, so one of the things that this company did was was put more money in to the subsidiary. And so when any time you put money into a subsidiary, it's an opportunity that should be thought about. What is the smart way to put money in? And try to be forward looking because a lot of times what happens is a subsidiary is just it's just funded through, you know, it's just an accounting function. They need money, there's book entries and you know, maybe sometimes there's a loan agreement, but it's it's not really thought through. And then that subsidiary starts to struggle and the parents thinking about how am I putting money in? And then they think, oh man, we should have security. And then they take security, but that's too late to secure the money that's already in. Um, you know, they may be able to secure money going forward. So really try to be forward looking. If it's a risky situation and you have an opportunity, you can put money in by way of secured debt and that will be respected. And you know, there's cases in, in Canada where intercompany debt has been held up because it's well documented, security taken at the right time. Um, so you know, it can really help you. And even if it's not, um, like in this case, you know, the, the company's putting money in by way of secured debt to the maximum extent they can, not because they want to really take full advantage of that security and go in and try and realize on the mine, take the asset, leave the unsecured creditors behind, which is, you know, would be a very aggressive strategy. This is more of a defensive strategy, which is they know that people may come after them. So when you put money in by way of debt, you establish a set off opportunity. So let's say that under DRC law, there's there's an ability to come back for those dividends. And what you don't want is you don't want to be in a situation where you the, the parent has put a whole bunch of money in, you know, by way of equity and and you're not getting any credit for doing that. You're still on the hook for dividends you took out. So, you know, there's all different ways that you you could it could be smart to put money in by way of debt. And it's really important to think about it and also try to have foresight and not try and scramble and put it in place um, when things have already gone a bit sideways. It's like the classic case for piercing the corporate veil is a parent company incorporating a subsidiary, undercapitalizing it to try to earn money. There's some sort of you know liability that gets created and they try to leave that liability behind in an undercapitalized subsidiary that can't pay its own bills. And so you, know, you, so you see that in, the, in the, the piercing test. Is it completely dominated? Do they only get funding when the parent wants to give it to them? If they don't get that funding, they can't operate. And then there's that sort of you know, the, the, the wrongdoing element. You know, you're, you're trying to do something overseas or anywhere in Canada even with a subsidiary, and then if something happens, you try to leave that behind. Of course, like that's the whole point to a certain extent of subsidiaries. You want to be able to put that capital in place in a way that if it you know, produces you know, returns, that's good, but then if you, you've limited your liability, if it doesn't, but again, you've got that tension between, between how, to, how to do that in the, you know, in the right way and other ways. And so the, the, the documentation that's used, especially in this sort of this JPAC situation, we're saying things like, you know, like the parent puts money into the sub, but of course, you know, in our fact pattern, we've got, you know, four different layers there. So you have to make sure you're respecting all of those layers and that, that each one is doing it in the right way and that dividends are being paid, you know, you know, each layer up. And those are all, again, they can be sometimes tedious steps, but if it comes time to a challenge to the corporate structure in any way, those, th you know, that, 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 that good rec record keeping and diligence really does pay off. So we just have our last slide and we're almost done here for people that are wondering. Um, so we just want to talk a bit about communication. Um, and uh, the, you know, so obviously there was the email, which is a bit inflammatory. So when we were talking yesterday, I said, um, you know, well, the first thing you should do is call that person and tell them to stop sending emails. And, uh, you know, my litigation colleagues explained to me uh, why that would be a bad idea. Yeah, I wasn't happy to hear that. <laughs> so I, then I, I, I played out for Celia the, the potential cross-examination when this case goes to trial, and the plaintiff's lawyer says, oh, hi, Mr. Smedley, I see you wrote this email uh, on the day of the berm collapse. Yes. 
um, and what happened after you wrote that email? Well, I got a call from head office and they told me to stop putting anything in writing <laughs> and it doesn't look so good. So, so, so I think, <laughs> I mean, we, we have to, so I, I, I learned that. Um, uh, I think that the, the key <coughs> though is it's, it's, it's really um, to capture a problem into a legal stream as soon as possible. And I'm sure many of you have some procedures to make sure that happens because, uh, you know, this is a, the company has a problem. The company needs legal advice, both about how to manage liability, but also how to behave appropriately in accordance with their legal obligations. So, you know, I think that there's, it's impossible to control every, um, every email in your company and people just, it's just uncontrollable. People feel the need to write emails that are highly inappropriate. And <laughs> I think we've all read the CanTrust emails, which are just horrifying that anyone who's within a company writes an email that says we dodged a bullet here. And you know, we're presenting a picture of a careless company and it, there's not a lawyer in sight. And those emails go from someone who's head of quality assurance, who I think maybe thinks he was you know, covering his own position by saying, I've told you, and it goes to the CFO and it goes to the CEO and it's a disaster and it goes to the Globe and Mail. <laughs> um, you know, so those kinds of emails, like that's also part of like, if you just, you know, having a very careful, diligent, thorough record keeping organized company is helps you avoid that situation. Or at least when it happens, you nip it in the bud. Cause it wasn't just one email. There were multiple emails. Um, so we, we're just going to accept that you can't stop these things. They do happen. You want to try to capture them into a legal stream. Importantly, though, once it gets to the legal position, you want to make sure that you're not worrying about your emails as a lawyer or your communications. So it's, it's important to think about privilege within a corporate group because technically different legal entities are different clients. So there are some good things, which is there is law, at least in Canada, recognized that um, the parent company's general counsel can have the subsidiary as his client or her client. So that's, that's a positive. And generally, there's a principle that within corporate groups, there can be common interest privilege or joint, joint defense privilege. And so there is a, a basic recognition that, yes, legal lawyers within a corporate group need to speak to each other. But there are some risks. One is, you know, you, you don't, you need to figure out the law of the DRC in our situation. What's their rules around privilege? And you also have to think about, well, who can waive privilege? Because there was an extensive case between BCE and Teleglobe where BCE made the decision not to continue to fund, fund Teleglobe and um, a, a subsidiary in the U.S. became bankrupt and they tried to waive privilege over some communications with in-house counsel. And the, the case, they, they weren't successful because the company that was bankrupt was not one of the clients. It was a higher up entity. But, um, you know, it's still, I think it's, it's important. It's peace of mind is also very important, especially in our profession. And it's good to be sure that you're confident that when you're having communications within your group, they are privileged and that they won't cease to be privileged. And sometimes, and probably more than happens, it's really appropriate and beneficial to document a common interest privilege agreement or joint defense agreement, depending on what the situation is, so that, and, and to have it vetted in the various jurisdictions so that you know that your assumption, which is when you're talking to your legal colleagues, it's privileged, you, you know it's true. Um, so that's, maybe this is a teaser for like our next presentation on privilege, um, but um, that, that was the last thing that we wanted to cover. So uh, I know we're, we're just past nine, so just I'm happy to take questions or comments or thoughts. I know there's a lot of knowledge and expertise out there. Sure. So the independence of the board being mentioned a number of times, right. are there concerns with having the nominees of the parent company's clients have to go to board? Can you repeat that for the board? Sure. The, the question is whether or not having nominees of the parent on a subsidiary's board can give rise to issues about corporate concerns about corporate separateness. 
and and you see it in, in the case law like it, it's often a fact that gets raised as a way to to show that there isn't that there's domination by the parent to the sub um, I think there are and I, I think you know in in, the, in a perfect world if you have a subsidiary that has you know no connection it's going to look much less dominated and much more independent but I think the case law also recognizes that it, it's a contextual you know point and so I think if, if all the members of the subsidiary if all the board members are members of the management and are directors of the sub, of, of the parent that it's gonna be much harder to demonstrate in practice that 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 subsidiary is is doing things in practice independently and for their own purposes and not for the purpose of the parent so again if you wanted to do that you'd probably want to be much more diligent in your record keeping and with board presentations that demonstrate that you're taking advice from the subsidiary and you're generating your own ideas again these things really don't have any clear-cut answers but but I think there's ways and there's ways to manage that but you know the, the more it looks like the parent is controlling that subsidiary the more you're at risk for that at least domination portion of the test maybe not the the, the improper purpose portion but the domination per portion and I think like like anything it's a balance there certainly are facts and circumstances where we've seen that it is important and, and, and we have seen and it's appropriate for boards to be mimicked all the way down the chain but again one other thing to consider though is local law and there are you know a lot of jurisdictions outside of North well actually what am I saying inside inside Canada requires <laughs> that local persons are actually on the board so again it's always a balance there's the, there's the balance between parent control and respecting as well as operating within the environment in which the the entity actually exists I think if you have at least, you, you've got to have at least one person locally. Ideally, you have a majority of people locally. And and the other thing, too, is that sometimes we see, um, you know, a document that's all uh, the, the parent and all its material subsidiaries are, are signed up to. And, and it's signed by one person as director of a whole bunch of subs. And there's no, re and, you know, that happens. And it's... It's sometimes a practical reality, but you've got to at least have resolutions for each, you know, each party. And you can't have a situation where, you know, the, subs the subsidiary finds out, like, I, I guess I'm a party to this agreement, you know, that's, so at least, even if you had a board of only, um, only parent representatives, you need to have some, sh some way to show that when they, when they authorize this particular document on behalf of the subsidiary, they turn their minds to the interests of the subsidiary. They were informed, perhaps they were advised by the GC of that subsidiary, that would be very helpful. And they had some materials that talked about how this affects the subsidiary. Like those kinds of things are, are, are helpful. But in reality, you, know, you often see parent representatives on the board. I mean, many companies are incorporated in BC, so they don't have to have Canadian directors. Thank you. There's another question from our web audience asking, uh, on a much simpler scenario, if an opco sets up a hold co to strip funds out from time to time for creditor proofing, same board, same operators, tax and liability protection motivation for setting up hold co. I'm hearing from the panel that this would not protect against piercing of the corporate veil where there is some big problem at the opco level. And is that correct? Okay, some very bad words there used yeah. there. <laughs> Stripping proofing. out bad, uh, creditor, creditor proofing, proofing bad. Uh, <laughs> but but there is a it is legitimate to organize your corporate affairs in a way that is you know protective. So to have like for example, um, you know a company might have its real estate in a holding company and its operations in a in a subsidiary, and as long as that's set up correctly, um, you know, it, it, w what you can't do is see, oh boy, Opco's in trouble. Opco's got some class action lawsuits. I think we'll just transfer the real estate up to Holco. That will not work. But if you are simply thinking, you know, I'm in an industry that is quite litigious and I do, you know, I do want to preserve some of my assets that, that aren't really part of the operations in a parent, that's completely legitimate. Um, and but the point is to do it early with foresight, like have foresight. So when you're thinking about, before there's any sort of 
uh, you know, bad guys on the horizon. I'll just go with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, you know, and there's like, who are those guys? Older so than all in the family, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm really showing my age here. But, um, you know, it's, it's, you want to do, do, do this planning when there's no problems. Usually people think about it and there's already an issue and then you're into concerns around fraudulent transfer, transfer for undervalue, et cetera. So it can be done, but it needs to be done. At, what, you, what you can't do is move assets around when, when there's already a question about solvency. Um, that doesn't work, but good planning in advance with good foresight works. So he's right because if you, if you see a problem and then you move assets away, the court is likely to see that as improper, an improper purpose to using that corporate structure. And if it's being done by the direction of the parent, well, then you have the domination aspect. There's both of your you know, prongs of the mirror facade test. Your, your veil can be pierced. But if you do it in advance, sort of anticipating a problem, but not with that in mind, then the courts you know, may see that as just a legitimate corporate planning exercise, utilizing you know, you know, separate corporate personalities and using limit, limitation of liability in the way that properly can be done. And if a problem is encountered down the road, you know, you're much more able to defend that structure. So again, having things, you know, your ducks in order in advance, I'm a bit of a broken record here, but you know, th those, those can be helpful if, when push comes to shove. a little bit about when it may be acceptable for a subsidiary board to make a decision that is not strictly in the best interest of the subsidiary but in the best interest of the organization as a whole and is its place in this in that organization recognizing that it gets benefits from being part of a wholly owned organization well, under like just as a, from a purely legal perspective the BCE decision from the Supreme Court of Canada sets out kind of what the duties of directors are when they're taking actions for the company. They have to act in the best interest of the company. And the Supreme Court's defined that to mean not just the shareholders. They mention things like the environment and other things where it's sometimes difficult to understand exactly, you know, what that constituent is. So at least in Canada, the, the legal framework allows for considerations that are broader than just simply, for example, shareholder maximization. And you saw it in the States, there was recently a bunch of CEOs that came out and said, maybe we should move away a bit from that, you know, short-term shareholder maximization type of view. And so in Canada, we we're already there to a certain extent. It means it's much more difficult sometimes to figure out exactly, you know, are you meeting that duty? Because the concept is very amorphous, but it does give the scope. And so if you're gonna do those things, you want to document it in a way that's going to demonstrate that, that, that the board was considering those issues. It wasn't ignoring the interests of its own, you know, separate legal entity. It was, you know, but taking into account the broader scope. And, and the case law certainly, you know, says, and there's a case law that's very clear about this. It says, of course, a subsidiary is going to look to its shareholders as one of the constituents that it should at least consult when thinking about making decisions. That's a perfectly legitimate thing for a company to do. I, I think it's also, like this comes up all the time in guarantees because it's, it's not a guarantee in isolation, giving a guarantee of a parent's obligations, that's not really helpful to the subsidiary. But you are really looking at it um, as an overall transaction. So I think it's fair to not look at, well, just the guarantee and isolation you have to look at and you'll often see these recitals that it's you know this is part of a financing that benefits the entire group having access to that financing benefits the subsidiary and you know there's also a risk profile like another thing that can happen is sometimes when a company is uh has financial difficulty they'll they'll be looking to this happens in Canada, you know, because for tax reasons, often Canada is not a guarantor of a U.S. debt. And all of a sudden, there'll be, when clearly the, the parent's in trouble, a request for a, a guarantee from the Canadian company. So that's a different fact profile. Now you're not just giving a guarantee in the normal course. Things are fine. You're, you're really thinking, I'm not in the soup right now, and I will be if I, if I put that guarantee in place. So that's, that kind of decision is a very... A tough decision for a Canadian board because they're not as aligned with their parent. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit fact driven, but certainly I think you, you, you get to look at the total picture, not just, you know, the, the document in isolation that you might be approving. Although, having said that, 
uh, I would go back to it's always important to know the local jurisdiction in which you're operating and there are certainly s civil law jurisdictions which don't allow entities to give guarantees unless they are specifically going to benefit. They don't have the same construct right. that uh, they say it was first two that we have here that a subsidiary is going to benefit when the whole group benefits. They actually need to derive a specific benefit from it. So you know there's always the balance and so again just going back to knowing the jurisdiction in which you're operating and having those local representatives who are familiar with those things is of critical importance for sure yeah. you can also pay a fee for the guarantee i mean that's something that sometimes gets yeah, there's there's some that happens from time to time just an, a fee between the parent and the subsidiary other questions mm, yeah I think Julie mentioned that human rights may be another emerging area that of risk, but I thought that there had already been some cases where some peoples from Mexico and Latin America tried to sue Canadian mining companies, but for whatever reason they had not succeeded or whatever. So that's already started, I thought, so maybe you could address why it hasn't stuck or that they didn't succeed. Um, so th there's, there is one case ongoing. Uh, there was one other I know of that did not succeed um, out of Latin America. There's a third case actually out of Eritrea, although that case doesn't involve um, trying to get access to the parent because the, the, the defendant parent company actually was um, directly involved in the operations. Um, so, w why haven't <coughs> those stuck? W one is ongoing and is going to trial. Um, I, I, think, I think there is a growing, I think the sophistication is slower to grow. Um, human rights cases are difficult to bring um, because of the nature of the plaintiffs, I think. So, I think you see fewer of those. Um, but I think. I, I think they're coming. And the, the, the mining case I mentioned out of Eritrea was actually argued at the Supreme Court uh, recently, well, in the last six months, and the decision's pending. So uh, uh, there, I think, will be a broadening of the types of actions that we're seeing. There are always barriers to those claims being brought, um, limited, resources, uh, limited resources, et cetera. But my my gut tells me, and having watched that Supreme Court hearing uh, on the video link, there was a significant mood among at least some of the judges. When I said judges are people and they want to they, they want to get to the right result, the legal challenges were huge to the plaintiffs in that case, and you could see a number of the judges were just looking for any path to get to the result that they thought was fair. So I think the cases are, are, cases are here. I think more will be coming. I actually think the environmental side of things is where the, the, the bigger future risk lies. I think environmental um, activism is growing. You see climate change litigation. They're, they tend to be better funded than the human rights cases. So I think that is the sort of the next frontier that we're gonna see more action in. I have one more question from the web here. In view of OSFI governance guidelines recognizing parent-subsidiary relationships, how would you interpret subsidiary board operations independent from parent, especially on enterprise policies? Yeah, I, th I think you know when you've got policies in place that 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 the. The, that the parent is sort of imposing on 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 a subsidiary, you know, there might be you know risk in that from a corporate separateness perspective, and also from this you know perspective of whether there might be direct liability. Um, I think you see it in cases where you've got policies that are m more broadly scoped and maybe allow for the subsidiaries to sort of generate more information and 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 and, and decisions up for approval or concurrence or whatever it is at a higher level, those might be a bit more robust to defend against certain things. Obviously though, when you have a situation where you've got, you know, you know rules being, you know, imposed on, on companies to do certain things, 
again, you know, you, you, ought, you, you want to be complying with that. And, and again, that shouldn't be seen as a derogation from corporate separateness more broadly, um, even if in the sort of specific circumstances you have to do certain things, you know, you know as a group. Yeah, I think just to reiterate that, Peter, we've talked about it. There's securities laws, there's OSFI, there's IROC, there, mm. there's the Public Accounting Board, there's any number of every industry operates within, inevitably operates within some kind of regulatory, pro re regulated profession of some kind. And so I think, it, Peter said, just to reiterate, there's always the balance there. It's important to, for operations to act independently. But it's also okay for there to be some kind of parent parent oversight, parent governance in, in that respect, and certainly when it's in compliance with other regulations and professional standards that apply. That's all from the web. Any more in the room? No? Terrific. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good day.